Hey there, YouTubers. It is Don from True Cable coming back at you again. Are you falling for these common Ethernet cable myths? I'll bet you are. So be right back. We're going to talk about copper twisted pair Ethernet cable. Okay, so the first myth we're going to talk about exactly what is Ethernet cable. All right, so Ethernet is a protocol. It's not a cable. Uh, that's something that people conflate. Uh, and it's understandable. The reason why is when you're referring to Ethernet cable, you're probably talking about copper twisted pair category cable. And the reason why that became conflated and confused with Ethernet cable is because it is purpose designed for the task of communicating Ethernet data packets in a modern wired network. So it's easy to see how that got conflated and people just say, oh, well, you know, just go get an Ethernet cable. Well, if you run across somebody who's like, you know, uber, uber uh, into networking, they're going to say, well, that, didn't mean, that means nothing. Uh, Ethernet's a protocol. What kind of cable are you talking about? Because many different kinds of cable can, in fact, carry Ethernet packets, coaxial, fiber, and copper twisted pair, too. So that is one of the biggest myths. Uh, and it, it also is, I wouldn't say a conversation starter, a very unusual conversation. But nevertheless, it is a little tidbit that might uh, be useful at the next trivia contest. So just understand Ethernet's a protocol. Copper twisted pair category cable is a purpose design cable that is often confused for it. All right, so the second most common Ethernet cable myth is just pick uh, the biggest, highest category rated patch cord and go with that. It's going to be great. Well, the reality is, is that uh, category matters. You should match it to the solid copper permanent link cable you're using, or if you're just using a sim a one patch cord for the entire communications channel from power device like a switch to a computer, then category can also matter. But most of the time, believe it or not, category is not super relevant. Um, what's actually much more important is does the patch cord pass patch cord testing? And we have some pretty extensive uh, video and educational material around patch cords and patch cord quality. And would you be surprised to know that more often than not, uh, if you pick up a patch cord out of a big box store online, it's going to fail uh, on formal TIA patch cord testing. And that's not good. Uh, fortunately, most of the patch cords out there that do fail, fail in such a way that uh, you, you may not notice, but there's various degrees of fail and bad. And so when you start putting together structured cabling systems, like for example with structured cable like this, and using patch cords at both ends, plugged into keystone jacks for example, then all of a sudden those problems magnify greatly. It's enough to bring down your entire network or degrade performance. And patch cords, interestingly enough, have been the source of many unexplained issues for some time. And oftentimes you don't need shielded patch cords. Don't fall for that myth. Um, shielded is not going to make your cable any faster. Um, there are use cases for shielded, but more often than not, you're not going to need shielded patch cords in your installation. In fact, you can even have a structured cabling system designed with shielded that's installed properly that will allow you to get away with using unshielded patch cords because unshielded patch cords are way easier to deal with. So uh, when you're wiring up a big server rack, for example. So don't fall for the myth that you got to pick a patch cord that is the highest rated like Cat8 and shielded. You're just going to waste money, get the right patch cord for the right job, but more importantly, make sure that patch cord passes testing and it's certified and component rated. All right, so the third myth, and this is a good one, and it's one that we run across quite a bit at uh, True Cable and we get asked a lot about, and that is shielded Ethernet cable that with a overall foil shield or individually shielded pairs 
is automatically, in every circumstance, superior to unshielded Ethernet cable, otherwise known as UUTP. And you see these referred to as like STP for shielded and UTP for unshielded. There's many different kinds of shielding and that's, it, there's various ways of referring to it, but we'll just use shielded to cover the entire segment of shielded and then unshielded to cover, well, unshielded. So is shielded cable automatically superior to unshielded? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, more often than not, shielded cable is going to cost you more money it's going to weigh a lot more. It's going to cost more to terminate. It's more difficult to terminate. It requires proper bonding to ground, uh, and that can get pretty complex. It can also be the source of a problem if you don't properly bond your cable to ground. So uh, there are use cases for shielded Ethernet. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's, it's great for uh, dissipating uh, very high PoE wattage, like 90 watt, 100 watt PoE. Uh, if you have a large cable bundle, shielded can uh, definitely help in that situation. It helps dissipate heat better from the, the PoE generation, uh, going across that current running across the cable. Uh, it can also help protect your uh, cable against interference, EMI, electromagnetic interference, radio frequency interference. So there are some use cases, but if you just use shielded cable when you don't need, if you don't have one of those use cases and you don't need it, then you just cause yourself a, a pretty difficult installation uh, because shielded cable's a lot thicker. It's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna require a great deal more effort for you to terminate and get bonded to ground properly. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Where unshielded Ethernet cable, interestingly enough, has already got some built-in shielding all on of its own. See, these copper twisted pairs uh, do a great job of canceling out most interference in your environment. Most, most home environments, for example, um, would not need anything more than unshielded cable. So uh, the reality is, is that this stuff's a lot easier to work with, doesn't require bonding to ground, that being the unshielded cable, and will uh, work just as fast as the shielded cable. All things being equal, the unshielded cable is going to be easier to install, easier to terminate, easier to manage, and it's just gonna make your life a lot simpler. All right, so the fourth myth we're gonna cover is you need CAT 6A or CAT 7 or CAT 8 uh, in order to get a quality cable and installation. Um, while it's true that those categories, those higher categories have a use in certain cases. The reality is, is that uh, most home networks aren't even going past two and a half gigabit these days. And in fact, a lot of them are still at one gigabit. Cat, lowly Cat5e handles that just fine. Well, Cat5e isn't as lowly as you might want to think. It's not. A lot of people have said, oh, I won't use Cat5e anymore. Well, uh, Cat 5 e does have an advantage. It's got a thin advantage. And for some installations, that's a real benefit. It's easy to terminate. Uh, it works up to 2.5 gigabit to 328 feet. And now let's compare that to the next move up, which is Cat 6. Well, Cat 6 can do 5 gigabit to 328 feet. That far exceeds what most home network speeds are going to achieve. And let's talk about even Cat 6 can be called upon to do 10 gigabit at shorter lengths. 165 feet or less, uh, depending on the environment you're installing it in. The CAT 6A handles 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, speeds all the way out to 328 feet. So I, I, it, most home networks aren't going to be carrying more than 10 gigabit uh, networking. And once you get the 10 gigabit speeds, you really should start considering alternative cabling technology such as fiber optic, which is more reliable for very high speed data transfers. So for example, CAT8 uh, is, you know, it's a higher category than CAT6A, so it must be better, correct? Well, not really. Uh, CAT8 uh, does 10 gigabit to 328 feet, just like CAT6A does. But if you want to achieve CAT8's maximum speed of 40 gigabit, that's only achievable to 100 feet. So as you start pushing those packets across those wires faster, your permitted lengths get shorter, especially once you go above 10 gigabit. So when it comes to uh, category cable, 
Uh, once your bandwidth needs move past 10 gigabit, and CAT 6A is, is pretty much the cutoff point there, then you start really should start thinking about fiber and stuff like that. Um, so getting the highest category cable is also not an a indicator of quality. Uh, you can construct a very poorly installed category 6A cabling system and get far worse performance than a extremely well executed and installed CAT 5E cable system. And I have uh, put my Fluke DSX 8000 uh, up and tested many different networks and found out that's exactly correct. Um, so it's not just the cable you're putting in, it's also the quality installation. How are you terminating your cable? Uh, are you using punch down or toolless keystone jacks? Or are you using uh, RJ45 or you know, APAC or, or AKA RG45 plugs on the patch cords and stringing those everywhere. So the quality of your installation matters a lot. So don't fall for higher category automatically equals better. Sometimes what's better is what works for your installation and your skill level and also what fits into your budget. The fifth common myth we're going to talk to you about is that you can somehow get away with more than 328 feet of Ethernet uh, copper twisted pair cable. And the reality is, is 328 feet is the real hard limit for Ethernet copper twisted pair category cable under any condition. It's an actual hard limit. So what's known as signal degradation, otherwise known as insertion loss, becomes much more severe as soon as you get past 328 feet. But you also have to also understand that 328 feet is a number that's predicated on several other factors, such as temperature. Uh, did you know that as your temperature rises, your links get shorter? Because copper is uh, one of the, th physics is how this works, is as copper heats up, it's not able to transmit data as efficiently or effectively. And so therefore, you're going to get data loss. So if you adjust your lengths for the ambient temperature in your environment, or worst case ambient possible temperature, then you might find out that you're not going to be anywhere near 328 feet. You might be restricted to 250 feet, for example. So uh, you know, the other thing is, is that, have you ever heard about the cable that works great in the morning, but all of a sudden starts giving you trouble in the afternoon? I have. And so what happened was uh, somebody ran out 300 and something feet of cabling inside of a warehouse and uh, open air warehouse, no climate control. And at a certain temperature, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you can, you can go 328 feet, maybe. But as soon as the uh, temperatures in the summertime started getting to 105, 110, 115 in that warehouse, then the temperature rose and the copper was not able to transmit data as efficiently anymore. So it started first, it would manifest with some uh, internet being slow problems and then it would uh, actually stop working altogether. By mid afternoon, it would actually stop working and transmitting data. So 328 feet is the hard limit, you should obey it. And even that has lots of caveats uh, all over it. And we have a lot of information in our Cable Academy, which lets you construct uh, and will guide you through the process of constructing a properly constructed channel, which includes patch cords and a permanent link, and all the variations based on that, with temperature taken into account and things like that, as well as your bandwidth needs. So 328 is the hard limit. Don't think about going past it for a lot of different reasons. All right, so the sixth myth we're going to cover is that Cat 5e is dead and buried. You know, don't just ignore it. Don't install it. Well, this is not true. As someone who I leverage Cat 5e quite a bit in my installations because one nice thing about Cat 5e, besides its low cost, is that it does two and a half gigabit. So I know it's good there. And as long as it's solid copper Ethernet cable, it will also transmit 100 watt PoE over a very long distance. That being 300 and something feet. Cat 5e is also much thinner and easier to install and work with. It gets around tight corners and bends. It gets into 
certain outside cameras, for example, that have tight outdoor housings that are hard to get the cable into. So CAF IV uh, doesn't have certain somewhat annoying things like a spline in the center of this CAT6 cable, for example. And if you compare the two cables next to each other, you're going to see that one cable is a lot thicker than the other. Well, that's CAT6, that's CAT5e. The CAT5e is quite a bit thinner, and sometimes thin is in. All right, so the seventh and final myth we're gonna cover is one I love to uh, have fun with people about, which is that ethernet cable is dead, just dead. Copper twisted pair, that's what we're talking about when people, a lot of people say ethernet cable is gone. You got this new fiber optic stuff and you'll, you know, this, this stuff is, psh, forget about it. False. The reality is, is that copper twisted pair is going, is first of all, is installed in a lot of buildings out there and it's already transmitting data uh, at one gigabit, two and a half gigabit. A lot of home equipment will probably isn't for the next 15 years gonna make a past 15, uh, five gigabit networking, for example, which CAT6 handles. So another big advantage of copper twisted pairs, besides the fact that it's extremely pervasive and easy to work with, is that it transmits power over ethernet. That being something to power up your camera, a Wi-Fi access point. Well, guess what? Glass doesn't transmit electricity, so a fiber optic cable is useless for that situation. Now I know there's people are gonna be writing in the comments, and please leave a comment, by the way, if, if, you, if you disagree with any of these points, but there's gonna be people just rushing into the comments to say, well, you can have ethernet and fiber in the same overall cable, and there you go, there's your power over ethernet. And my argument back is then, why did you bother with the fiber anyway? Uh, the reality is, is that power over Ethernet, its biggest advantage is it carries data and power over the same cable. Now you need to run two cables, so fiber optics better how in that situation? It's not. Uh, so Ethernet copper twisted pair category cable is still very good for 10 gigabit, up to 10 gigabit networking, I'm going to say. And I'm going to say that it's also more than adequate uh, for a lot of installations at the current time, and you're gonna find out that a lot of installations and future installations are actually hybridized installations. You got Wi-Fi, and you for the areas you can't wire up. You've got copper twisted pair uh, for legacy applications, like being able to plug in an ethernet port, uh, or PoE, things like that. And you've got fiber optic too. That's also being used for long haul uh, backbone or really high speed long haul backbone, or both, or or you just need really, really, really high speed and you're not going a great distance. But So each one of those technologies has its place. But that doesn't mean though that just because fiber came along that copper twisted pair is dead. That's not true. So with that all said, I'm going to say happy networking. But first, please do uh, leave us a uh, like or a dislike if you didn't like the video. Subscribe to our channel leave a comment below in the section and hit the notification bell too, just so you know when we have a new video that's come out. So with that, I'm gonna say you have a great day. Quick, before the time runs out, if you enjoyed this video, head to our website below, check out our Cable Academy. If you're looking for some new videos, check them out next to me. Thanks for watching.